Well, good morning, everyone. We are showing 905 on the wall, so we'll get started. And hopefully you all enjoyed your extra hour of sleep last night, so that should mean extra attention this morning in Sunday school and energy and all that fun stuff. All right, so we will continue our study in knowing God this morning in Sunday school, uh, the book by J.I. Packer. But before we jump into that, I will open us in a word of prayer. So if you will, pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, our loving and gracious Father, Lord, I thank you for this time this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to come here this morning uh, to have protection from the elements, uh, to be able to have a place uh, to focus and study your word and your truth. God, I pray that you would liven us to attentiveness, that you would block out the distractions of the world, whether it's notifications or thoughts that creep into our minds this morning. I pray, God, that you would help us to focus on you. I pray, God, that you would help us to focus this morning on knowing you more, deeper, and better, and specifically this morning as we focus on your love and your grace. So, God, I pray that you would grant us your grace this morning, that our minds and our hearts would be ignited and open to your truth, and that your word would speak to us this morning, that we would know you better by the time our, this morning's hour is ended. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so we are continuing our study in Sunday School uh, of J.I. Packer's book, Knowing God. Um, a somewhat uh, smaller by collection of systematic theologies, but theology, so a study of God. And so we come uh, this morning to chapters 12 and 13, which are titled respectively, The Love of God and the Grace of God. And so up to this point, by quick recap, uh, we've talked about the existence of God, we've talked about the person of Christ, the Holy Spirit specifically, God's attributes, both incommunicable and communicable attributes, and we spent last week talking specifically about the Word of God, and so now we come to the love and grace of God. Now, before jumping into this study this morning, I want you to think for just a few moments about those in your life, past or present, who have loved you the most. It could have been a parent or grandparent, a brother or sister, another relative you were close with, or maybe even a great friend. I want you to think about them for a moment and ponder what it was they did for you to know you were loved. Was it how they treated you or cared for you? Or didn't judge you? What about them makes them come to mind when thinking of those who have loved you greatly in your life? Think about that for a moment. Now, I want you to think about those that you love greatly. And think about your love toward them. Is your love always patient and kind? Does your love for them envy or boast? Is it arrogant or rude? Does your love for them insist on its own way? Is your love for them irritable or resentful? Does it rejoice at wrongdoing or rejoice in the truth? Does your love toward others bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things? Does your love end? Does it have imperfections or limitations? So think about that as you think about your love toward those who are closest to you. You'll probably recognize that familiar language out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So as we think about love in our lives, I want us to turn together to 1 John chapter 4. So toward the back of your Bible, first letter of John chapter 4. <clears throat> 
So in 1 John chapter 4, let's look together at verses 7 and 8, and let's read them together. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. While you're there, let's jump down and also look at verse 16 together. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. We previously studied the attributes of God a few weeks ago, and one of those attributes mentioned is that he is love. J.I. Packer said, When we looked at wisdom, we saw something of his mind, speaking of God. When we thought of his power, we saw something of his hand and his arm. When we considered his word last week, we learned about his mouth. But now, contemplating his love, we are to look into his heart. Just last week, Pastor John preached on 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. So if you missed last Sunday, then I encourage you to listen to that sermon as it's such an important passage of Scripture that certainly pertains to our study this morning. So let's now look a little deeper into this section in 1 John chapter 4 that you still have open. The English word love, used here in verses 7 and 8 of 1 John 4, is from the Greek word agape. Probably a lot of you know that. Agape being the noun form of the word and agapeo being the verb form, the action. Agape means to esteem, love, indicating a direction of the will and finding one's joy in something or someone. It differs from the Greek word phileo, which is also translated as love in the New Testament. So when we see love in our English translations of the Bible in the New Testament, there are two Greek words behind that. One is agape and one is phileo. The word phileo is also translated as love. And it's also, it means to love, indicating feelings, warm affection, the kind of love expressed by a kiss. So one of those is a volitional love of the will, while one is an emotional feeling kind of love. So my first question for you this morning, and yes, I'm looking for answers, is which kind of love, out of those two, as we think about those two, agape or phileo, is most prevalent in our culture today, whether it's in movies or commercials to buy jewelry around the holidays, or generally, generally accepted as love in the modern culture. What say you? Phileo, how so? Yeah. Everything's about feeling good, isn't it? Yeah. Other thoughts? I mean, does the jewelry commercial say, buy your wife this nice diamond ring because you love her, simply? No, it draws up these emotions, right, and it's the right thing to do because it's a big emotional thing, and that's why you ought to do that and spend all that money on jewelry, right, as an example. Phileo, love, I think, is also about you. I'm doing this because I'm going to get something in return. Yeah, Rod says phileo could be because it's more about you. You're, you're kind of uh, looking for a reciprocal love instead of unconditional. Yeah. Phileo love changes, yeah. Hills and valleys, right? Depends on how they make you feel or how you're feeling, I suppose. Yeah, true. Any other thoughts on agape love versus phileo love as we think about it in our culture today? I think I kind of mentioned it last week, but if we were to let culture inform us regarding what love is, if we were just to take in what's on Netflix or what's in movies or whatnot... Would agape be the type of love that we learn in our culture? No. <laughs> Seems like a clear no, right? Seems like a clear no. All right, so also of note here uh, in 1 John, um, just kind of a side note if you will, when love is used as it is in verse 7, if you look back there, uh, the verb is in the present tense in the Greek, which means not just that it's happening now in the present, but the Greek present tense denotes a continuous action. I think that's something that's unique about the Greek language. Present tense means a continuous action. 
So these present tense verbs in these verses are not to be confused with aorist tense. I'm not trying to get off on a Greek lesson here, but aorist tense, A-O-R-I-S-T in the Greek, means like a once, uh, one specific action at a spe- specific time and place, as opposed to the present tense, which is continuous action. So what's the point? The point is for us to see that when John says, let us love one another here in this passage, it's not a one-time good deal, a one-time good event, or a short-term expectation, but ongoing and continuous, ongoing and continuous. Let me share a news story that gives us just a glimpse toward agape love, at least in our world. There was a very unusual military funeral in California in December of 2013. Sergeant First Class Joseph Gant, who fought in both World War, World War II and the Korean War, was laid to rest. He had been captured in Korea in 1950 and died the following year, so that would be 1951. But his body was not returned for many years, and his death was never confirmed by the North Koreans. His wife, Clara, waited for decades for her husband to come back. She regularly went to meetings with government officials seeking information about what had happened. Clara even bought a house and had it professionally landscaped, so all Joseph had to do when he returned was to go fishing. She was 94 years old when his remains were finally brought home for a military funeral with full honors. It wasn't the homecoming she dreamed of, but she finally knew his fate. Clara told a reporter who, who, reporter who interviewed her, He told me if anything happened to him, he wanted me to remarry. And I told him, no, no. Here I am, still his wife, and I'm going to remain his wife until the day the Lord calls me home. So you see, love, true godly love, is not temporary or transient. Love is a commitment that is meant to last. Love is not based on everything going right or always being happy. Love is not an emotional feeling, but rather a choice of the will. Casual commitments do not produce a foundation for deep and meaningful relationships. Instead, we should love others as God loves us, with an unfailing love that never ends. So, question related to the first one. Let me ask you, what does our culture-informed love look like? What does our culture-informed love look like? And we kind of talked about it already, so let me jump to the next question. I want to hear from you. How does that create challenges for us as Christians with a desire to have a biblical love for others? How does our culture and trying to have a biblical love for others reconcile or not? What are your thoughts? What culture says about love versus biblical love. Well, I, think, I think another word that Lust. And, and, when you, and the culture really, I think, uh, connects those two concepts together. So whenever you talk about love, it's sort of similar to what you're talking about with um, you know, phileo and feelings and everything. It also puts right in there physical love as well <laughs> as the And so, it, so when you can't separate those two, Yeah, that's a great point, that lust is probably what is very prevalent in modern society, right? And working against our Christian or biblical view of love, lust, and and I don't have a dictionary in front of me, but temporary infatuation, maybe, right, would be a good way to define it quickly this morning. But yeah, lust is certainly working against us desiring to live godly love. Yes, John? Just in in terms of uh, the way people regard friendship, I just saw a headline, um, of course, in this very divisive time politically, but this person was describing how he had to abandon uh, certain friends, just decide to remove them from his life, people he would have loved, and, and because they held different views on some political matter. Just so the, the, the circumstance or whatever that is, say, well, here's you no longer be my friend, just cleared out his friend. Yeah, John's pointing out that with the, you know, the opposing politics, if you will, in the, in the country or the opposing points of view, 
social viewpoints. Um, you, you've got individuals that are, hey, I've got to unfriend you, or I've got to carve you out of my life, etc. And it makes me think of love your enemies, right? I mean, that's the extreme, and, and yet, is that? If we simply carve them out of our life, is that loving them? I, I don't know. Food for thought. Any other thoughts on our current culture and how it reconciles or not with godly love? You. <laughs> Especially we see with what the culture says in parenting, loving is just giving whatever yes. somebody else wants, and it's just there's no what is best for them, what's going to bring them along into a better path or for godly living. It's just give them whatever they want. Yeah, so in parenting, is giving them what they want love, right? Or giving them what they need? <laughs> So you said it very well. Um, cultural love has got to be convenient, right? And I think, I mean, that is that's certainly a bad thing. Uh, love in today's culture has got to be convenient for you or else you're just not going to do it, uh, which does not reconcile with a biblical point of view of love, right? Any other thoughts before we move on? Yes. The culture doesn't believe in saying I'm sorry, but biblical love says I'm sorry. Yeah. Cultural love is prideful above saying, uh, being apologetic and, and apologizing where necessary, but biblical love would certainly be humble and apologetic where, where it's required, right? Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yes, sir? I think one of the struggles is that the culture will pro, pro, uh, portray love um, let me put it this way. Not, not always that um, love is portrayed in the culture are illegitimate. There's, there are, part of the the illusion is that um, uh, what they portray, there are elements of truth in it, mm -hmm. but there, those elements draw, draw you away from sort of the baseline, the foundation uh, of that love. So, so it, it becomes difficult to discern what is true about those expressions from the culture and which are deceptive. And so that's the, the, the imperative for the Christian to, to ground that love in a, in a Christ love for us, and then all those expressions become much more clear uh, later on. Yeah, I think that's such a great point that, uh, you know, not to throw everything in culture out the window, so to speak, because some expressions um, um, are, are good expressions, but our discernment needs to grow, right? Which is a fantastic reason for studying this morning, God's love. So that as we have a better, better biblical uh, understanding of God's love and how we are to love, then to your point, we have greater discernment. Uh, and we can discern between, hey, that's a bad example, that's lust, or that's phileo love, or conditional love, or hey, that is a good example of unconditional love, right? So really good point. Yeah, Josh. I think what you just said, to add to that, it's hard for the world to understand God's love because they don't see it. Mm -hmm. it you know, they don't, their understanding of love is slightly skewed, slightly broken. So when we as Christians say, hey, God loves you, what they hear is different than what we mean. And so they're hearing, yeah, God loves you, and then they put all the conditions on the other side. If I'm obedient, if I do this, if I do that, and then when I fail, God no longer loves me. Or if I, you know, and, and one of those sins that Christians seem to not like, then God doesn't love me, and, and etc. So I think as Christians, our challenge is to try and explain with a whole lot more words and nuance, what does it mean that God loves you? Center. Yeah, to Josh's point, we, we've got to represent and explain the love of God, but also I think part of your point was uh, we've got to live it so that they see it, and they see a difference between you know, somebody who's not a Christian, and they say, I love you, but they see those actions associated, but then a Christian says, I love you, and they see the uh, actions associated with it, right? It's a really good point. Um, J.I. Packer, in, in this section, he says, to know God's love is indeed heaven on earth. Think about that for a moment. To know God's love is indeed heaven 
on earth. So now let's ask ourselves rhetorically, how is God's love given to us? How is God's love given to us? You will open your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. So if you were still in 1 John 4, you're going to turn to the left toward the beginning of the epistles, the letters in the New Testament. So Romans chapter 5. And if you're there in Romans 5, uh, read along with me in verse 5. So Romans 5, 5. You'll see in the second half of the verse, it says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So the answer to the question, it is through the Holy Spirit that God's love has been given to us. Notice here the word poured. It's as if God's love has flooded our hearts. Or consider John 13, verse 35, which says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So how is it possible to love one another? It's because God's love has flooded our hearts, and we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. It is not by our own power or effort. And I'd say Josh preached a really good sermon on this several weeks ago. As we consider God's love, I want to remind us of a couple of his other attributes, mainly two, that God is spirit and that he is light. So follow with me for just a moment. As we remember that he is spirit, that means that he is not confined to a fleshly body as we are. We are confined to our flesh. We studied about God's omnipresence, right? And the fact that we cannot be outside of his presence. Our limitless God is the same God who is infinitely love. Furthermore, as we remember that God is light and in him is no darkness, this is the God who is love. His love is pure, holy, infinite, and without darkness. We must remember these attributes and much more as we truly try to comprehend and grasp at least an elementary understanding of the love of God. Let's consider a profound statement made by J.I. Packer. He says, The statement, God is love, means that his love finds expression in everything that he says and does. Let me read that again. The statement, God is love, means that his love finds expression in everything that he says and does. So ponder the entirety of the Bible as it captures human history from creation to future glory, from Genesis to Revelation. God's love is perfectly in every action and every word. As Christians and reborn children of God, we truly have a perfectly loving Father who is perfect in all his ways. Packer offers the following definition of God's love, and we're going to spend some time working through this. He defines it as, It is an exercise of his goodness toward individual sinners, whereby, having identified himself with their welfare, he has given his son to be their savior and now brings them to know and enjoy him in a covenant relation. So let's unpack that definition a little bit. First, God's love is an exercise of his goodness. Psalm 145, 9 says, The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. So first, God's love is an exercise of his goodness. Second, God's love is an exercise of his goodness toward sinners. His love includes grace and mercy. Think about the object of God's love, us, humans, his creatures. We have broken God's law. Our nature is corrupt in his sight, and we merit, or what we deserve, is condemnation and final banishment from his presence. Charles Wesley put it this way, he hath loved us, he hath loved us because he would love. He hath loved us, he hath loved us because he would love. Third, God's love is an exercise of his goodness toward individual sinners. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13 says, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits, or from the beginning, to be saved 
through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in truth. Each individual Christian here or tuning in has been saved by God's sovereign love and his goodness towards us. Fourth, God's love to sinners involves his identifying himself with their welfare. God truly cares about us. Think about parents who have great concern for the welfare of their children. Or think about the opposite, and those parents that have little or no love for their children. God saves us not just for his glory, but also for his gladness. Fifth, God's love to sinners was expressed by the gift of his son to be their savior. The measure of love is by how much it gives. Let me say that again. The measure of love is by how much it gives. And the measure of the love of God is the gift of his only son to become human and to die for sins and so to become the one mediator who can bring us to God. This may feel like an Awana review here, but let me share some verses. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19 says, And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Or Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Or John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Or Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Or Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And sixth and finally, God's love to sinners reaches its objective as it brings them to know and enjoy him in a covenant relation. A covenant relation is where two parties are permanently pledged to each other in mutual service and dependence. So think of a marriage. A covenant promise would be the marriage vows in our example. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25 says, In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in re remembrance of me. It is by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross through faith in him that we are able to have a covenant relationship with God. As we conclude this section on the love of God, let's look one more time to 1 John chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, flip back toward the end of your Bible again to 1 John chapter 4. And we want to look at verse 9. So 1 John chapter 4 and verse 9. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Jesus is the manifestation of God's love and by him alone is eternal life. So as a Christian sitting here today, how much do you grasp of God's love? Does it mean to you all that the word of God has said that it is? Do you ever grumble or show discontentment in circumstances in which God has placed you? Are you outside of his love at this point in time? Is that possible? Has he withheld his love from you? Are you ever distrustful, fearful, or depressed? Have you ever been or grown stagnant or half-hearted where God has called you to serve? Just some questions to ponder this morning as we contemplate the love of God. If you're still there in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 11, John goes on and he says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So ponder these final questions. If someone observes your love for others, we kind of talked about this earlier. So if someone observes you in your life and your love for other, others, think about maybe your wife, husband, children, neighbors, co-workers, 
people at church, your enemies, or maybe those who persecute you, would they learn anything at all about the greatness of God's love to you as they observe you? So before moving into the grace of God next, do you have any questions about the love of God? I'm sure this is something we could spend years on, to be quite honest with you. But do you have any burning questions about the love of God or burning thoughts? Bobby. I was thinking with that definition, I, I wonder if it's incomplete. Um, or maybe it's just particular in love for sinners. Because in John's gospel, the few times that it says the father loves the son, and that's a different thing. Um, but, it, but it's interesting because Jesus says, Jesus prays that God will show us the love that he shows to Jesus. Um, so have you thought through, like, how, how does that relate or, like, correlate with one another? So I certainly agree that a definition of God's love written by a human author is certainly inadequate. Yeah. I think that's what you're pointing out. Yeah. By all means, I, I think we could expound further and further upon that, right? Because um, by common grace throughout the world, I think people can experience God's love that way as well, right? Yeah. Um, so I think there's so much more there. But I think J.I. Packer's trying to focus in on the Christian in that love. Not that it's perfect by any means, right? Yeah. yeah. Any other thoughts on that? Well, I, just, I just find it fascinating how, not fascinating, just wonderful, delightful that the love that God shows us is the love that he shows to Jesus. Yes. Because Jesus is in us. But, but that's... Uh, yeah, that's that's far greater. I mean, and that's and that's what we're extending to to other to our enemies. Is that's you know kind of back to the earlier question you asked. Um, the difference between culture's love and our love is our love isn't our love. It's God's love. You know, um, that's just marvelous. That's all I got. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, 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 there's a lot there, right? And yeah. and like I said, I think maybe a month or so ago, Josh preached a really good sermon on that, and he's like, God loves you, right? And he spent time on that, trying to get us to grasp this concept that by God's love pouring into us and overflowing, that's what should overflow in, into others, right? Um, and I think that's the challenge. The question that I hope we all leave with is, uh, is that happening in our life? Are we trusting fully in that love um, that is perfect and, and whole and more than sufficient for our life, you know, or are we uh, not trusting and questioning the capability of God's love, if that makes sense? Josh? Well, I think uh, maybe a good question that a lot of people uh, from the world would ask is, how do you relate God's love and then justice? And so uh, how can he be loving and yet still carry out justice in the world, justice against sin? And, because that's a different understanding of love that what probably a lot of people don't understand. So there's so, the pop quiz for the teacher. Is, uh, sure. So I'm going to totally solve that problem for us. Yeah, so Josh asked, you know, hey, how, for the, for the uh, culture around us, how do you reconcile then God's love with justice, right? And I am going to totally punt because next week is the justice and wrath of God. So I'm going to totally punt that. Uh, you know, but the short answer is a, a holy God uh, is a holy judge and perfect judge and sin must be judged, right? Uh, but we'll get to that more next week. I will punt on that on purpose. Any other thoughts on the love of God before we move to grace? Yes, sir. Also, just one other thing. I think one of the challenges is we look at God's love as we naturally want to compare that to human expressions of love. And so there's, there's a transcendent quality in God's love toward us that's meted out through his spirit that in human expressions of love simply either it doesn't exist or it's lacking in that, you know, it, it, uh, so we're much more prone to, to uh, deciding, you know, if, if it is a good expression of love by, you know, you did this for me or, or you know, there was some, you know, a reciprocal sort of, you know, love, whereas there are times when God's love um, in his, his omniscient, you know, look throughout history means that there is suffering. Yeah. Um, I, I, most of, I would you know, venture to say that, that when I love my, my kids in a way that results in their suffering, they don't feel like they're loved. And that same, ex, that, that same you, know, you know, sort of internal conflict exists, you know, when, 
know, there's love toward one another. So there, there's there's that just challenge of, of not seeing those expressions of love um, in the same way because because God's love does transcend both the experiential but also this transcendent, you know, omniscient love as it's as it's meted out you know, in, in, in a far greater way than we than we do on. Yeah, I won't do your comments justice, but I'm, you're making me think, do we filter our worldly thoughts of love and concepts through the word of God and grow it and let God refine it? Or do we take God's concept of love and what it is and filter it through our worldly perspective, right? Obviously, there's a right answer there. Okay, let's spend the remainder of our time looking now at the grace of God, at the grace of God. Has anyone heard the expression, God's riches at Christ's expense. Has anybody not heard that before? Okay, so if you haven't, think about that again. Grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. So in one sense, grace is getting what we don't deserve. In all reality, we absolutely deserve God's punishment at our own expense. So as we dive deeper into understanding God's grace, I want to challenge you up front to examine yourself and ask, where do I stand with my understanding in living out of God's grace? Do you try to earn God's grace? Are you trying to work your way toward a point where you can experience his grace? Are you trying to meet God where he's at? Or do you truly grasp the grace of God. So think about those as we move through this last half in this study on grace. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. He also says in Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Other English translations of that last verse there, verse 21, say, I do not frustrate the grace of God or make void, or ignore, set aside, or turn my back on the grace of God. Paul fully embraces the grace of God. So question for you, and I want to hear what your thoughts are. Why do you think people struggle with grasping the grace of God? And I'm thinking kind of along the lines of those who are like, well, I can just get my life together then I can meet God where I need to. We put limitations on him. We put limitations on him. Yeah. We struggle to grasp it for the same reasons we struggle to grasp the love of God, because we can only understand it in human terms. So to, un- to love somebody unconditionally or to treat them like they don't deserve to be treated is not something that we are likely to do or understand. Yeah. I think it's a small view of God. Um, If you don't understand grace, then you have it in mind that somehow God can be bought. That somehow he can be, that we could offer up something that would appease him, or or we can have some place where he would finally be satisfied. Mm -hmm. That is a small view of God. Because it's because God is complete in in everything that he is, he needs nothing from us. So any offer of anything. Yeah, John offers we have a small view of God, and we are certainly trying to earn his favor to some, some degree. Aaron? 
to point out, I think, that our culture and, you know, what we encounter every day um, in the workplace, uh, you know, around town, et cetera, <clears throat> think about the influence of grace there. Well, for one, is there an influence of grace in the culture? Uh, or if we were to take from the culture what culture would define as grace, whatever that may be, what, what would that mean for us? Um, and I would probably argue that maybe more than any time in history, uh, gracious attitudes are lacking more than ever. Um, we have such a self-centered uh, culture nowadays, especially with social media and those things, and what it has grown in our culture, it is working the other way, away from grace, right? Uh, it's not having a gracious and a uh, loving attitude toward others, but it's a look at me, it's all about me attitude. Um, so good points. Any other thoughts on why you think people struggle with grasping the grace of God? Jeremy, you, you mentioned self-centered. You're elaborating on the self-centeredness, and it makes me think, as we ponder self-centeredness, is that a worship of ourselves or worshiping God? Yeah, food for thought. Any other thoughts before we move on, on why people struggle with grasping the grace of God? I'm trying to stay on the subject here, here myself too, um, but I've always, I, it's, it's a letting go and knowing that God's in control, so I've always kind of struggled with grace and election and uh, you know uh, I think of Pharaoh you know his heart was hardened well if he wasn't born created in the first place he wouldn't go to destruction so why was he created but to give glory to God but he's still going to destruction you know at the end of the day at the end of his life um, whereas he was mentioned if he was never made he wouldn't have to experience that destruction he wouldn't have to go to hell so they have just always that there's things that we don't understand, and at that point, it's just like, God, you know more than I do, my finite, finite mind just can't understand. Um, so you're in control. Yeah. Does anybody else struggle with wanting to control the world around them and their destiny, or are we all perfectly obedient to God and his sovereign path for us? Something to think about, right? All right, so there are four truths, and I know we're getting near the end of our time here, but there are four truths that Packer offers that grace presupposes. Presupposition, if you're wondering what in the world does that mean, but presupposition or to presuppose is something that's simply required before a fact or to come first in logical thought. So it's kind of the foundation we have to lay uh, before we understand properly the doctrine of grace. Our modern age, as we've already basically talked about and pointed out, tries to undermine these four truths. So think about that as we work through them. So number one, first, our moral conscience. Our moral conscience. Conscience means with knowledge. Con science means with knowledge. And we know that God's law is written on our hearts. In our world today, moral relativism often rules in society, attacking full force a biblical conscience and calling into question nearly all truth. We often have a high opinion of ourselves, another point we've hit on. We often have a high opinion of ourselves. We view material wealth more important than moral character. The ends seem to justify the means. We are guilty of dismissing bad consciences, and the average modern American, despite maybe drunkenness, gambling, reckless driving, sexual laxity, differentiating between black and white lies, as if there's a difference, and so on, view themselves as generally good. If you've ever watched Ray Comfort when he's doing street evangelism, and you can probably YouTube him, YouTube him if you want to see, but when he's doing street evangel evangelism, so many times he asks somebody, one of the first questions is, do you think you're a good person? And what do they say? Do you think anybody says no? Of course they don't. They all generally believe that they're a generally good person. Until, of course, he confronts them with God's law, and they see themselves as liars, thieves, adulterers, and murderers at heart. So the first truth to understanding God's grace is our moral conscience. Second is the retributive justice of God. In modern society, we turn a blind eye to wrongdoing if we can, 
Parents fail to correct children. That was kind of brought up earlier. Parents fail to correct children. Teachers fail to correct their students. And the public at large puts up with more and more minor offenses. I think an argument can be made that the line of tolerated crime in America is sliding ever so often in the wrong direction. There seems to be a dying appetite for justice and a growing appetite for anarchy. Abraham says to the Lord in Genesis chapter 18, verse 25, Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? There is just retribution or just punishment from God. It is his holy nature to punish sin. For him to allow sin to go unpunished would be contrary to his very nature. Third truth is the spiritual impotence of man. If you remember God's attributes of omnipotence, meaning all-powerful, then you can better understand that impotence is lacking power. It's the inability to take effective action or it's helplessness. We as God's creatures lack the ability or power to mend our relationship with him. But what if I can just clean up my act and start following God's law? Romans 3, chapter, or verse 20 says, For by works of the law, no human, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Regaining his favor is beyond our own capability, the spiritual impotence of men. And fourth, the sovereign freedom of God. In God's sovereignty, he is free to allow justice to take its course. He owes us no pardon of sin or no changing of the law to accommodate our sin. As a matter of fact, doing those things would contradict who he is. Romans chapter 9, verses 15 and 16 say, For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. These four truths, that we are morally sinful and guilty, God is holy and just and sin requires punishment, we are incapable of saving ourselves, and God has sovereign freedom to save whom he will is the foundation for understanding his grace. Grace is not earned or deserved. The grace of God is love freely shown toward guilty sinners, contrary to their merit and indeed in defiance of their merit. God shows his goodness to those who only deserve just punishment. There is a cause and effect relationship between grace and salvation. Let me read to you Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. By grace you have been saved. It should be familiar to you. And then down in verses 8 and 9 of Ephesians 2, we see, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. Salvation comes from grace, not the other way around. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. In the New Testament, we see three significant connections of grace. First, grace as the source of the pardon of sin. There are three aspects of salvation, justification, sanctification, and glorification. We want to focus here on justification. That's that moment, justification is, is that moment when a person puts their genuine trust and faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They have realized that the wages of sin is death, and they will stand trial before God and will be found guilty. And there is no pardoning from that judgment except through faith alone, in Christ alone, who has paid the penalty for our sins in full on the cross. It is by the grace of God alone that our sin can be pardoned, as John 3.16 again says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Instead of the eternal punishment and separation from God we deserve, we inherit eternal life. Second, grace as the motive of the plan of salvation. If you will, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. 
In Ephesians chapter 1, we'll read verses 3 through 10. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. We could continue all the way into chapter 2, but we see here that God's plan of salvation was motivated by his grace, love, and mercy for us. And then third, grace as the guarantee of the perse- or preservation of the saints. We've seen how salvation is the effect of grace. This means that our future is assured by God's grace. You'll turn with me finally over to 1 Peter, toward the end of your Bibles, in 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, we'll read verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 5 in the NIV says, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation. As we close, Philip Doddridge, he was an English minister in the early 1700s, he said, grace first inscribed my name in God's eternal book. T'was grace that gave me to the Lamb who all my sorrow took. Grace taught my soul to pray and pardoning love to know. T'was grace that kept me to this day and will not let me go. By God's grace, our future is assured. So let me close this section on grace by quoting a familiar hymn. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be, Let that grace now, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to there, to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, O take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. God's grace is indeed amazing. What questions do you have about God's grace? All right, let us pray together then. Our Heavenly Father, God, we are so grateful and thankful for your love and your grace, both undeserved, Lord. We absolutely deserve your just and holy punishment and to be banished from your presence. And yet, God, you loved us. You loved us so much that you sent your only sin to die on the cross for us, Lord. That at the cross... That is a dead-end road that takes all of our sins in the end there. And from that point, Lord, through faith in Christ, we are made righteous in your sight. Not because of us, God. Nothing we have done or can do has made us righteous before you. But it's only because of your Son and through your love. God, we are so thankful and grateful for this time this morning to study your word. God, I pray that you would... Hold these truths in our hearts and in our minds. Help us to meditate on them throughout the day and throughout the week, God. That we would grow in our understanding of of your love and your grace. And God, that it would impact and change our lives and that others would see your love in us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.